بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين uh, As we mentioned in, in the sessions of Surah Amma uh, we said that Allah عز وجل uh, generally connects the beginning and the end of the surahs together and the beginning uh, of the surah with the end of the previous surah. Uh, this is uh, again uh, another case, an example of that. Allah Azza wa Jal started the surah, Surah al Nazi'at, uh, in the first session we had by giving an oath, swearing that the day of resurrection will take place and he gave some uh, details of that. Well, in the last set of verses, Allah Azza wa again goes back to address and give more details on uh, the day of resurrection. <clears throat> Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الطَّامَّةُ الْكُبْرَى But when there comes the greatest overwhelming calamity, Allah Azza wa Jal, first of all, الطَّامَّة, as Ibn Abbas said, الطَّامَّة is one of the names, and we mentioned that in the first session, Al-Tammatu is one of the names of the day of resurrection and it is referring to the second blow, the blow of the resurrection. Allah Azza wa Jal is given details again to reconfirm to the Quraysh that this day is certainly coming and your resurrection will certainly take place and you will be held accountable for your denial and all your deeds. And why was it called uh, an overwhelming calamity? Be because it overwhelms people to the extent that it makes them forget everything. Why? Because of the grave events that take place during that day. It's something that is certainly overwhelming. It overwhelms the minds to the extent that it makes them forget everything. And then the serious talk starts. The day when man will remember that which he strove. That day when people are resurrected and gathered, every person will remember everything he's done, whether good or evil. But the problem there is, there will be nothing to do. There will be no turning back. You can't do anything that will benefit you or change anything on that day. All you will be is in a state of fear of what your fate will be. That's very scary. It's terrifying. At that moment, people will realize that the currency that they can buy and sell with is deeds and that good deeds are means of bliss and that evil deeds are cause of destruction. The Prophet وسلم, said as narrated by Abu Hurairah عنه, and it's reported by Ibn al-Mubarak classified as authentic by al-Albani. He said وسلم, two short Two short rak'ahs. He was standing by a grave. He said, two short rak'ahs from what you pray as an optional prayer, which you are undermine. You pray it very fast. You don't see any significance to them. For this man to add to his record of deeds, 
will be dearer to him than this life and what it contains, this world and it, what, what it contains. Ali radiallahu anhu was standing by a grave once and he asked those around him, he said, one astaghfirullah, for this man is worth more than this world and what it contains. When that moment happens, accountability starts. There will be no deeds and that's again, that's the meaning of the qiyamah starting for the dead person. There will be no action, no deeds to be performed and accountability will start. Whether the person will have a blissful life in grave or torture, that will be decided by his or her deeds. And hellfire will be exposed for all those who see. Ibn Abbas said, it will be exposed. It will be made clear. And all people would see it. And see it blazing with fire. People will see it with their own eyes. Can you imagine seeing the fire of hell with your own eyes, not knowing whether you will be saved, you will be saved from it or not? That's why it is overwhelming. Then Allah starts about they're talking about two categories of people. So as for he who transgressed, this type, Allah is talking about either those who disbelieve or transgress by transgressing the limits of Allah, the boundaries of Allah by sinning. And preferred the life of this world. Meaning, his time is consumed for this dunya. All his concern is accumulating more and more of dunya, enjoying more and more of its pleasures, and he forgets the akhirah and gives up work for that day. Hudayfa radiallahu anhu said, the thing that I fear the most for this ummah is that they will favor what they see over what they know. They favor what they see, the glitter of this dunya, the enjoyment of this dunya over what they know about the hereafter, Jannah and so this person who transgressed and preferred this worldly life, Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَإِنَّ الْجَحِيمَ هِيَ الْمَوَى نَسْأَلُ اللَّهِ السَّلَامَ Then indeed hellfire will be his refuge, his final abode, his destiny will be hell. Hell that includes both physical and spiritual punishments. His food will be from Zakum, a tree planted in hell. And their drink will be Hamim, the intensely hot drinks. The Prophet ﷺ said in a narration narrated by Ibn Abbas, reported by Ahmed in his Musnad, classified as authentic by Al-Albani. He said, if a drop of Zakum was to fall on earth, it would ruin and corrupt the lives of the people of earth 
Then he said, How would the case be for those whose food will be zakum? If a drop would ruin the entire world, would corrupt the entire world, how would the case be for someone whose food is going to be zakum? Then Allah Azza wa Jal talks about the second category of people. وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ But as for he who feared the position before his Lord and prevented the soul from unlawful inclination, desires, Unlawful inclinations are plenty. Following desires and unlawful inclinations is one of the greatest means and major means why people sin and disobey Allah. It's one of the means <clears throat> leading to people diverting and deviating from the path of Allah. Therefore, the one who controls himself, who suppresses himself from following its desires and unlawful inclinations, deserve Jannah. Because that takes a lot of struggle, a lot of striving, a lot of effort. You're fighting against your own self. External enemies are much easier to face than you, facing you. You haven't, we have enemies within our bodies. And that is the most vicious and dangerous enemy anyone can face. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, addressing his students, he said, you live in an era, in a time where the truth controls desires. A time will come when desires will govern the truth. And then he said, we seek refuge in Allah from such times. I don't know what Ibn Mas'ud would say if he was to look at our time and see how far off we are from the path of Allah and we and see how much our desires control our lives. These people, Allah Azzawajal says about them, فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ Then indeed paradise will be his refuge, the final abode, the eternal bliss is the prize for those who struggle hard against their desires, who do not give in to unlawful inclinations. He said, Ibn Abbas said, this is the reward for he who fears Allah Azza wa Jal when he is about to sin and he remembers the stance before Allah for accountability and therefore refrains from committing that sin. We ask Allah Azza wa to make us amongst them. Then Allah Azza wa Says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ السَّاعَةِ أَيَّانَ مُرْسَاهَ They ask you about the hour. When is its arrival? Allah Azza wa Jalla is addressing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, telling him that these who belie you and deny the day of resurrection and accountability ask you in mockery about the time of that day. 
Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Abbas said, some of the polyth polytheists asked Muhammad وسلم, about the hour and when is the time for the hour. So Allah revealed this verse. Allah addresses Muhammad again saying, Fima anta min What knowledge do you have of it that you should mention it? Meaning, you have no knowledge of it, O Muhammad. Another meaning, there is no benefit of knowing its time. A man came to the Prophet, and this is in Sahih al Bukhari. A man came to the Prophet, and he was a Bedouin, one of the Arab. He said, Ya Rasulullah, mata sa'a? When is the hour? When will the hour ha come? The Prophet ﷺ did not answer him. The second time he asked, the Prophet didn't ask, answer him. And then the man kept quiet. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, who asked me that question? The man said, I'm the one. He said, he didn't say the, uh, the hour will happen when this and that. No, he said, what did you prepare for that time? How prepared are you if this should happen now? And this is a question each one of us needs to ask himself. If I die now, what have I done to save myself, to rescue myself? from the wrath and punishment of Allah Azzawajal. Am I ready to face death? See, death is not scary because we end this life. It is rather scary because we start the real life for which we will be recompensed for everything we said and did in this life. See, there's, since there is no benefit from knowing the exact time of the hour, Allah جل, kept that knowledge to Himself. Not even Muhammad وسلم, the, the dearest creation to Allah جل, the most beloved to Allah جل, not even Him. This knowledge was not disclosed to anyone. Another reason is that people this way will continuously work and strive harder in order to rescue themselves, not knowing when, keeping that undisclosed is the factor of surprise which makes people work harder in order to protect themselves. إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ مُنْتَهَىٰ To your Lord is its finality. Meaning, Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who knows this knowledge. When uh, Jibreel in the long hadith that is in uh, Al-Bukhari, when Jibreel came in, in the form of a human being and walked into the masjid where the Prophet ﷺ was sitting, uh, and he sat down right in front of him and he asked the Prophet وسلم, about Iman, about Islam, about Ihsan. And then he asked the Prophet وسلم, and in each one of these, the Prophet وسلم, was given him the detailed answer to every question. Right? But when he asked him this question, Mata Sa'a? Now the Prophet وسلم, knows that this is Jibreel, but the companions didn't know. And they were the ones who were puzzled. Who's this man? Who's this stranger who doesn't look like anyone whom we know? And he doesn't look like a traveler. There are no signs of traveling. He's white, clean, tidy. Okay. At the end, the Prophet ﷺ said, This was Jibreel teaching you by means of asking me question and me answering him, teaching you your religion. One of the questions was, Mata Sa'a? The Prophet said, anha bi min as The one who's asked has no knowledge about it 
just like the one who's asking. So Allah concealed this knowledge and told Muhammad that the only one who knows that time, the only one who possesses that knowledge is me. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Innama anta munthiru man yakhsha. You are only a warner for those who fear it. You, Muhammad, were only sent to warn people about this day. To warn people about the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal. To warn people about this, their stance before Allah Azza wa Jal. To warn people about the consequence of disobedience and rejection to the message of Allah Azza wa Jal. So who, he who fears Allah, will succeed and have an eternal enjoyment. Certainly not to be compared by the limited, restricted enjoyment people have in this life. And he who acts otherwise will regret when regret and sorrow are of no avail. Allah says, concluding, كَأَنَّهُمْ يَوْمَ يَعُونَهَا لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً أَوْ ضُحَاهَا It will be on the day they see it, they see the day of judgment, as though they had not remained in this life except for an afternoon or a morning thereof. When people are resurrected and see that this is a reality. Resurrection is a reality. It took place. Accountability is a reality. It's about to take place. They see the fire of hell blazing before their own eyes. They will forget 50, 60, 70, 80, 100, 150 years they lived on earth. It will feel as if it was only a part of the day, an afternoon or part of the morning, the early morning of the day, or the early part of the day, they realize then and again, when certainty is of no avail, because nothing can change now. One will face his record of deeds, that will speak out and he will read it himself. Indeed, brothers and sisters, reflecting upon the events of the Day of Judgment, reflecting on the creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, should change our hearts, should soften our hearts should be a, a motivator for us to refrain from sinning and hasten to please Allah Azza wa Jal. Seeing these terrifying moments or events is something that Words fail to describe the emotions one feels when he reads such verses in the Quran are so overwhelming. But the problem is that in most cases our reaction to the verses is limited to the moment we read or hear these verses or the explanation of the verses. The matter should be that we take lessons from what we hear or we read and make that change into a lifestyle of obedience. It should strengthen our faith in Allah Azza wa Jal to the point that whenever we're faced with 
our main clear enemy, shaitan, or our lower selves with desires and unlawful inclinations, that should translate into making us ready to counter that and face it in order to rescue ourselves in the hereafter. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to benefit us from what we learn, what we hear, and what we say. And with this we conclude Surah Al-Nazi'at. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu.